client, we have running embedded closed captioning and we also have sign language interpreters. At the end of each session throughout the fair, the speaker will take two questions, or, or more than two even. You may ask questions live at Ustream and Twitter. If the speakers do not have time to answer all of the questions received, please feel free to direct your, your questions to inquire at nara.gov. Our hotline for genealogy questions will be open today from 1 to 4 Eastern Standard Time. We'll have archivists available to help you with your research questions. The toll-free number is 1-855-309-8404. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker this, this morning, Damani Davis. His the topic of his topic, the title of his topic is Genealogy in the Freedman's Bank, Records of the Freedman's Savings and Trust Company. If you are seeking freed African American ancestors in the post-Civil War era, this talk is for you. Damani Davis shows you how the records of the Freedman's Bank Friedman's Bank Savings and Trust, 1865 to 1874, are a valuable resource. Damani Davis is a reference archivist at the National Archives Research, Research Services Division in Washington, D.C. He's been with us in this position since 2005. Damani has lectured at various local, regional, and national genealogical conferences where he focuses on the African American presence in federal records. A native of Philadelphia, and a veteran of the first Gulf War, Damani pursued his undergraduate studies at Coppin State University in Baltimore, Maryland. From there, he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in history in 1998. He further pursued his studies at the Ohio State University, where he received a Master's of Art degree in history in 2001. Please join me in welcoming Damani Davis. Uh, good morning, and thanks, Diane, for the excellent introduction. Uh, today's presentation is on the Freedman's Bank, officially known as the Records of the Freedman's Savings and Trust Company. The Freedman's Bank is an excellent source of documentation on the African American family after the Civil War. For those who are researching African American ancestors, uh, one of the most difficult periods is the period during slavery, when there's very scant documentation on those who were enslaved. But the, free, the records of the Freedman's Bank is one of the federal records that we have here to kind of fill in that gap. Now, although the Freedman's Bank was an initially chartered for those who were, for the benefit of those who were ex-slaves, it was not only limited to African Americans. Uh, throughout the South, there were also uh, white Southerners and also recent immigrants who took advantage of the Freedman's Bank services. Uh, but today's presentation is going to focus on some of the African Americans during that period. Now, in using the Freedman's Bank as a federal record to trace African American ancestors, do not confuse the Freedman's Bank with another institution during that period, which was known as the Freedman's Bureau. Oftentimes, we have researchers who come here to the National Archives, and in interviewing those particular researchers, they state that they've uh, researched their ancestors in the Freedman's Bank or in the Freedman's Bureau, but in further discussions, we find out that the person actually uh, uh, researched one or the other and had the two different record groups confused. Uh, the Freedman's Bank is, a, is very easy to research. It can, you can research it through a name index. It's now available on Ancestry. It's available here at the National Archives on microfilm and on CD. Now, to give the historical background of the Freedman's Bank, the Freedman's Bank actually was formed 
to meet a pressing need that was occurring during the Civil War. As African Americans began to participate in, in the U.S. colored troops, many of them began to draw wages for the first time. These, oftentimes these were individuals who had never been paid or had never earned official wages as workers. Because they had no financial experience and no financial institution to help them manage their money or their wages, many uh, officers in the Union forces tried to meet this need by forming local financial institutions for their benefit. But eventually, John W. Alford, a congregational minister and abolitionist from New York, decided to form a national organization to fulfill this extensive need. John W. Alford served as, an, as a clergyman or an, an, an attache to Sherman's army during Sherman's march through the South. He had gone to Savannah in 1864 accompanying Sherman's troops, and during that period he observed the conditions of recently freed blacks, particularly those who were serving as U.S. colored troops. Uh, because of some of the problems that he saw, John W. Alfred returned to New York and met with philanthropists and leading businessmen in that particular city on, Ju on January 27th to plan a benevolent banking institution that would provide black soldiers with a secure place to save their money Sorry. Okay. yes 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 to provide black soldiers sorry with a secure place to save their money and at the same time encourage the values of thrift and industry in the newly free African American community after the Freedmen's Bank was founded, it was first headquartered in New York City, but it later moved to Washington, D.C. in 1867. It was initially designed as a trust that invested solely in government bonds and was not focused on profit. A board of 50 trustees was authorized to manage the bank. However, later as the bank began to expand and, and attract many depositors, uh, the, bank, the bank's policy or the, the management gradually moved away from the bank's initial policy. As a result, the bank collapsed due to a combination of changed investment and loan policy, the panic of 1873, overexpansion, mismanagement, abuse, and fraud, and some fraud amongst the upper management. It is estimated that over 70,000 depositors had open accounts in the Freedman's Bank with a total, uh, with a, a total number of bank deposits uh, totaling over $57 million. Here at the National Archives, there we have uh, surviving s signatures of depositors for 29 of the Freedmen's Banks, or of the uh, various branches of the Freedmen's Bank that existed. At its peak, the bank operated a total number of 37 branches in 17 states and in the District of Columbia, making it one of the first multi-state banks in the nation. Mobile, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, and Col Columbus, Mississippi, and Lynchburg, Virginia are three of the branch, or four of the branches without indexes. And as you look at some of the cities that have Freedmen's Bank, you notice that not all of them were in the South. We had, we had Freedmen's Banks in, in uh, a branch in St. Louis, Missouri, New York, New York, New York City, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and so forth. But for the most part, the Freedmen's Bank branches were uh, dispersed throughout the South. Okay, now what kind of genealogical information can you find in the Freedmen's Bank records. Okay. Here at the National Archives, microfilm publication M816 has the registers of signatures of depositors with basic identifying information on each of these 
depositors. And on, on these cards of deposit, you can find the names of each depositor, their account number, age. It gives their complexion and physical descriptions, the date that they originally uh, made the deposit or opened the account, their place of birth, the place where he or she was raised, occupation, names of spouses, children, parents, siblings, and sometimes there are brief remarks on each of the cards. For those who are trying to identify the names of former slaveholders, sometimes the names of for former owners and mistresses on the plantations are given. And for anyone who, who is doing African American research and you're trying to break that 1870 barrier and trying to get back into some of the earlier records, oftentimes the name of the uh, slaveholders can be the most valuable piece of information you can find. And sometimes you can get that from the Freedmen's Bank records. Okay. We have other records here for those who are interested in a, the larger administrative functions of the Freedmen's Bank. Uh, microfilm M817, index to deposits and ledgers uh, for the Freedmen's Bank gives some, uh, some of the administrative uh, information and M874, Journal of the Board of Trustees and Minutes of Committees and Inspectors of the Freedmen's Savings and Trust Company. Now I'm going to get to some examples of Freedmen's Bank records. Here's a basic Freedmen's Bank records of an individual named Henry Adams. On this particular record, Henry Adams provides some of his basic information concerning his life, which was required on, to open his particular account. He gives the date on which he opened his account, June 26, 1872, states that he was born in Jasper County, Georgia, raised in Louisiana. His residence is Shreveport, Louisiana. At the time he opened the account, he was age 29. He gives his complexion a physical description, uh, black. Occupation at the time was a wood chopper, but for genealogical purposes, uh, the valuable information is when he gives the names of his parents and his siblings. State that, states that his father's name was Samuel Carter. His mother's name was Millie Carter. He has siblings also, James Carter, who lives in Georgia, Dennis, Winnie, and Nancy in Louisiana, Eli Carter in Robinson County, Texas, Squire Carter in DeSoto Parish, Louisiana, and he gives the names of Nelson, Zechariah, Catherine Collins and Judy Peggs, but doesn't give where they live. But for any, for, for you who are, who may be a potential descendant of Henry Adams, this can be a very valuable find if you did not have this information. Another example is that of Captain O.S.B. Wall. Uh, O.S.B. Wall was one of, was the first African American commissioned captain in the regular army in the United States. Uh, on his particular Freedmen's Bank record, Again, it gives the, his uh, physical description. He's described as 5'10". For complexion, he's described as mulatto. It gives the names of his children, Edward, Stephen, Sally, and Belle. His place of birth is Richmond County, North Carolina. And his residence is Oberlin in Lorain County, Ohio. He was, in, he was in Ohio at this time because he was sent to Ohio by his father. His father was actually his former master. Uh, but once he got to a certain age, his father sent him to Oberlin in Ohio to be educated and gave him his freedom. At this time, he was also employed as an agent for the Freedmen's Bureau. That is very valuable because the Freedmen's Bureau is one of the other federal records that we have here at the National Archives. And if someone is a descendant of OSB Wall, you could then, after seeing this information on his Freedmen's Bank account, where it shows that he was employed as a Freedmen's Bureau agent, you can then try to go through the Freedmen's Bureau records to see if you can find more information on OSB Wall. That's something that we emphasize here at the National Archives. Within all of the various federal records that we have, they only give a piece or only a portion of the biographical information on your ancestor, but they also give clues that can lead you to other federal records that can be useful. And I'll show how that can be done after, in a few slides. Here's John, one more example is of John Wesley Cromwell, uh, who was a historian, 
excuse me, journalist, educator, lawyer, and former former slave here in Washington, D.C. He was born in Richmond, I mean, sorry, in Portsmouth, Virginia, and was raised in Philadelphia. Uh, he later moved to Washington, D.C. to attend Howard University and became uh, one of the famous journalists and activists here in Washington, D.C. in the late 1800s. His occupation at the time that he opened his Freedmen's Bank account was a teacher here in Washington, and he gives the name of his, his father, Willis H. Cromwell. He states that his mother at this time is dead, but he gives the names also of, of his brothers and sisters, Levi, Willis, Armstead, Martha Ann, and Esther Nash. Okay. Now I'm going to show how using Freedmen's Bank records, you can then try to use clues provided in the Freedmen's Bank records to navigate other federal records. Here is an example of an individual named Reuben Pinnell. And his, free, his first Freedmen's Bank account that we found, which was opened in 1867. On this particular account, he, st he gives the name of his former master and mistress during the period in which he was enslaved. His master's name is given as Martin Stouter, and the, his mistress was named, well, is listed as Betsy. Gives his physical description, 5'4", light brown, and the names of one child, Benjamin Pinnell, states that his place, his place of birth was King William County, Virginia, and his residence at the time he opened his account was 18th Street between L and M in Washington, D.C. He later opened another account in 1873, and something that I want to point out is that uh, something that's common when you're in any of the records that you may investigate is various discrepancies that you may find. Just notice that in every type of record, or every example of a record that I have on this individual, Reuben Pinnell, there, there's going to be a different variation on the spelling of his name in each record. Okay, here he, in the first record, there's Reuben Pinnell. His 1873 account, his first name is spelled differently. And on this particular account, when he's, he's listed as age 62. His complexion and physical description is given again. His residence remains the same at 18th Street between L and M. His occupation is a laborer. The, the new piece of information on this particular account is the name of his wife, Eliza Pinnell. That was not given on the first Freedmen's Bank account. Okay. Now, with Reuben Pinnell, I searched some of the Freedmen's Bureau records that we have here at the National Archives and was able to find a marriage record for Reuben and Eliza Pinnell. In the marriage records from the Freedmen's Bureau records, it gives Eliza, Pin Eliza Pinnell's maiden name as Henderson, Eliza Henderson, which again is oftentimes a very difficult piece of information to find when you're doing genealogical research, trying to track down the maiden names of married women. The family is listed again in the 1880 census, another federal record that you can make use of here. Again, his name is spelled differently. In the census, the way the B is spelled, it really looks, it appears to be a G. So I actually, I wrote it that way just to show that sometimes there can be discrepancies. And when you're, especially when you're doing research online, if the name is spelled the way it looks on the census, it can differ from how you're expecting the name to appear. And if you're, if you're keying that name in and nothing comes up, we advise researchers to try various uh, versions of the name to see if you can find something, because sometimes if you enter this into the database uh, and you adhere to that rigid idea of how the name should be spelled, it wouldn't necessarily appear. But here, Reuben Pinnell, age 67, huckster, states in the census that he was born in Virginia. His wife, Eliza Pinnell, is listed as age 35. 
She's wife, keeping house, born in Virginia, and Mary E. Pinnell, their daughter, was age six, was born in Washington, D.C. Okay. Another example is from Alfred Pope. His first Freedman's Bank account was opened January 25th, 1870. But this particular account was made on the behalf of a larger committee. It was not a personal account. It was uh, an account made on behalf of his church, which was Mount Zion Church in Georgetown here in Washington. On his particular, on this first Freedman's Bank account, it states, a draft signed by three of the banking committee accompanied with the passbook will always be payable. Banking committee, Edgar Murphy, Barton Fisher, Alfred Pope, and John H. Williams. But on a particular account, for some reason, John H. Williams' name is crossed out. I assume that means he was no longer a member of the banking committee at the church. Later, Alfred Pope has another Freedman's Bank account, August, 18, August 18, 1871. It gives basic information. His residence is Georgetown, occupation, night scavenger, and give, but this one gives the name of his wife, Hannah Pope. Hannah Pope also opened her own Freedman's Bank account, August 18, 1871, the same day. Her residence is given as Frederick Street in Georgetown. For occupation, it states she lives at a, sh a shop. Children, it li there's listed a Catherine, and she also lists her mother, Barbara Williams. Okay. Now, for Alfred Pope, after finding his Freedman's Bank account, I wanted to see if I could find other federal records that we might have here at the National Archives that documented his existence. Alfred Pope had an affidavit of freedom in the local Washington, D.C. District Court. On his particular affidavit of freedom, it gives some insight into some of his background and some of his experiences. The bearer Alfred Pope, a colored man who will hand you this note, was a servant of the late Colonel John Carter of this town. By Colonel Carter's will, Alfred was set free and is now, with my consent, as executor in the enjoyment of his freedom. Alfred caused this necessary certificate of, free of his freedom to be entered on record in your office and had in his possession a certified copy. About a week ago, his dwelling house took fire in the night, and it was destroyed with all of his furniture. Alfred wishes to leave the district in search of employment and wants to obtain a copy from the record of the evidence of his being a freed man. I would, I would accompany him to your office to offer in person my testimony and the of foregoing facts, but I am very unwell and unable to do so. Will you, will you be so kind as to render him the service he needs by giving him the renewed evidence of his freedom in paper form? Very respectfully, John Marbury. Okay. I also found information on Alfred and Hannah in the Freedmen's Bureau records. Uh, for the Washington, D.C. field offices, there were marriage records that were used to uh, uh, give an official Give, to give official recognition of marriages for individuals who were f previously enslaved. You know, during slavery, individuals marry in their own uh, ceremonies on the plantations. Sometimes that would consist of jumping the broom. Sometimes they would have clergymen who would officiate the wedding. Sometimes uh, the wedding would have the sanction of the slave owners, other times not so. But these were individuals who considered themselves to be husband and wife, you know, even though they were enslaved. But the reality of slavery was a, the fact that it was an institution in which slave, I mean, marriage was not officially recognized. So one of the first functions of the Freedmen's Bureau was to provide official marriage documents for individuals who were now free and who had considered themselves married. And many of these marriage documents 
these uh, recently freed slaves provide the dates in which they considered themselves to have been originally married. On this particular form, it has Alfred and Hannah Pope, I mean, Alfred Pope and Hannah Cole, which was her maiden name. Again, that which these marriage records can be very valuable in, in that it gives the maiden names of the uh, wives, okay? The Pope family was listed in the 1870 census, which was the first census in which all African Americans were listed. In the 1870 census, Alfred is listed at age 46. He's a common laborer. Hannah, age 40, is listed as keeping house. Their children, Catherine, age 20, is teaching school. Rachel, 18, is teaching school. Alice, 16, is at home going to school. Barbara, 13, is at home going to school. Alfred, age 10, is at home going to school. And it's William, age seven, John, age five, and Emma, one. They're again listed in the 1880 census. Alfred is age 56 at that time. It states that he keeps a wood yard. Hannah, age 51, is listed as keeping house. Rachel, one of their daughters, 28, is a dressmaker. Barbara, age 23, is a school teacher. Alfred Jr., age 20, works at the wood yard. John, 14, is going to school. Emma, age 11, is in school. And Lulu, age 8, is in school. Okay. Again, that's just showing how these records, once you find an individual in one type of federal record, always go based on one piece of information you find. Potentially, you can have clue, or find clues to investigate other federal records. Again, Alexander Stewart, this is his Freedman's Bank record. This is an, another example of an individual providing that crucial information, the names of, you know, the former slaveholder. Again, once you, if you're investigating or researching individuals who were formerly enslaved, the names of the former slaveholder is the most valuable piece of information you can find. Because outside of those slaveholders' records, there is no other type of documentation that you're going to find that can help you trace those particular ancestors. Uh, we, often, we often get researchers here at the National Archives seeking information on slaves. Slavery was not a federally regulated institution, meaning it was considered a private, it was an issue of private property, private business transactions. So those records would have no federal connection and thus would not be at the National Archives. Most of the records here at the National Archives are going to be these various forms of records that were produced during the period of the Civil War, during the period of emancipation, because this is the first time that the federal government is going to have direct uh, administrative activity connected with people who are form formerly enslaved. So that's going to be, of course, the Freedman's Bank, the U.S. Colored Troops for those who served in the military during the Civil War, Freedman's Bureau records, Southern, Cl Southern Claims records. Okay. So, for instance, if you're a descendant of this individual, Alexander Stewart, you may not have, in all of your research, you may not have known the name of the former slaveholder. But just from looking Alexander, uh, looking up his deposit in the, free, in, in the Freedman's Bank, bam, you have the name of his former master, Albert, Albert B. Bessie and his mistress, Jane. From that point, after exhausting your research in federal records, you can then go to the local level. Uh, his birthplace was Prince George County, Maryland, and his residence is Barry Farm at this time. So, you know, we, if he was born in Prince George County, Maryland, his chances are he was enslaved during slavery. He was still a resident of Maryland. You could then try to track down Albert B. Bessie and see and try to locate 
that family's records, whether they exist on the, in the local court, whether they're at the Maryland State Archives, whether they've been collected by uh, some of the local universities and so forth, but that's the same process and procedure that you would uh, go about on any state. Once the name of the slaveholder is identified, you can really get great insight into these ancestors. Okay. Alexander Stewart had a second account. This one is from September 29, 1871, Berry Farm. Is his place of uh, residence. He's a laborer. His wife's name is Mary. Children, Henson and Edward, and his mother, Mary. Siblings, Henson and Eliza. Again, Alexander Stewart and Mary, who was referred to in the Freedmen's Bank records, were also in the Freedmen's Bureau marriage records. In the marriage records, it's uh, Mary's maiden name is given as Henson. Okay. Alexander Stewart and Mary Henson. And their residence at the time of their marriage was Prince George County, Maryland. Okay. One more example, just showing this basic information that you can find within the Freedmen's Bank accounts and that you can then use as, you know, just a foundational type of uh, document to then look into other federal records. Here's the Freedman's Bank account of Frank Over Jr. His account was opened on June 12, 1871. He was a resident at the time of Washington, D.C., 424 1st East. He was age 21 at the time he opened the account. Physical description, dark complexion. His father was named Frank, mother named Josephine and siblings, Elias, Andrew, and Nanny. Okay. Here's uh, Frank Over's manumission record that was found in the records of D.C.'s district court. Gives the name of his owner, a Venerondo Polizzi. And Frank Over was manumitted on the uh, 10th of August, 1861, which was close to a year before D.C.'s official emancipation. In his particular uh, affidavit of freedom, a description is given of Frank Over, and then this Frank Over is actually the father of Frank Over Jr. who opened the Freedman's Bank account. On this description, it states, to all whom it, whom it may concern, be it known that I, Venerando Polizzi, have released from slavery, liberated, manumitted, and set free my Negro man, Frank Over, being of the age of 30 years, and able to work and gain a sufficient livelihood and maintenance. The family of Frank, the Frank Over's family, is found in the 1870 census, which again is the first census that counted all African Americans, meaning people, individuals who were formerly enslaved are now being counted and identified in the census for the first time. Uh, Francis Sr., the father is age 49. His occupation is coach survey. Uh, he owns $1,000 in real estate, according to the census. His wife, Josephine, age 42, is keeping house. Their son, Charles, age 22, works at a clothing store. F Francis Jr., who opened the Freedman's Bank account, is age 18 and works at a dry goods store. Andrew, age 16, is in school. Virginia, age 14, is in school. Anne, 11, is in school. And Walter, age 9, is in school. Also within the household, there are several boarders who are living there. And this is something that was very common, especially in urban areas. As people began to move in from the countryside, oftentimes those who uh, already were established in the household would take in boarders as a means of supplementing their income until, you know, the boarders would then work for a while and, you know, eventually get their own dwelling place. The boarders are named as the Atkinson family. There's Edward, age 32, Mary, age 24, and Edward, age 2, and John, one years old. 
Okay. 1880 census, again, the family is documented. Francis Over is age 58. He's a laborer at U.S. Coat Survey. Josephine, age 52, is still keeping house. Frank H. Ho Frank H. Over Jr., age 29, is a porter. Virginia Over, 24, is just is at home. Anna Over, age 21, teaches school. Walter T. Over, age 20, is a servant. And Josephine Over, 17, is in school. Okay. Now, for those who would like to read more about the Freedmen's Bank, we have an excellent article in the National Archives Quarterly Journal Prologue. Uh, the name of this article is The Freedmen's Savings and Trust Company, an African-American Genealogical Research by our former colleague, Reginald Washington. And you can access all of our older prologue articles on the National Archives website at archives archives.gov. Okay. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions at this time? Thank you, Mr. Davis. We do have two questions that came in from the Ustream account. The first question is about women. Mm -hmm. How common was it for women to have accounts with the Freedmen's Bank? I, just offhand, I don't have actual. Uh, offhand, I don't have actual uh, statistical uh, any type of statistical breakdown. But in my own uh, exposure or experience, and you know, looking at these particular records, it was somewhat common. Um, I've seen several numer well, numerous, a, a decent portion of these accounts were opened by females, by women. Thank you very much. We have a second question that came in, and this one is about names on the account. And they're, specifically, they're wondering, are there any other names on the account searchable, or is it just the account holder? From, from my experience, it depends on where you're searching. I think. These records are now available on, in digitized format on Ancestry.com. And I think they are now searchable by any name that appears on that particular account. Here at the National Archives on our CD version, I think it's limited to the person who opened that particular account. But even with that, I would, the one caveat I would give is even if you search by that person's name on, in the digi digital format, if nothing comes up, don't take that as the final say on that particular individual. Um, anytime you're dealing with information that's being put into a database, and especially when it's being transcribed from a lot of these written documents that oftentimes can be, you know, have very difficult spellings to make out and as far as the letters and so forth, there can be discrepancies. So uh, that's just one caveat. Keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you so much. And while we were sitting here, we got another question that came in. Uh, this is for Libby Tidwell. She wants to know, is anyone gathering the business records of slave owners in a centralized place? The, the, the most recent information that I've been able to get concerning that type of project is something that the Library of Congress has embarked on. There's a project, I can't recall the exact name of it, but there's a project in which they are gathering the plantation records of former slaveholders. You know, so throughout the South, they're gathering these records and making these records available on microfilm. And eventually, I think they're going to have those records available in a digital format. Now, the details of that, I'm not 
knowledgeable en enough of it to, you know, go into any uh, deep details, but I know that's a long-term project that they have embarked on. We're at this point, the Library of Congress is trying to gather as many of those records as possible. And keep that, keep that in mind. The, the, what we have here at the National Archives and what they do at the Library of Congress are kind of supplemental. Again, we have every record that has a federal connection. Um, so if we wouldn't have those plantation records here since that's not, that wouldn't have had federal jurisdiction, but you can find that at the Library of Congress right now. Thank you so much. Actually, we have a couple of more questions that have come in if we have time, and I think we do. Uh, the next question is, how common was it to find institutions as account holders, such as churches or schools? Uh, again, I don't have any, st oh, uh, in s many of these questions are, you know, really great research topics. That's something that, you know, we can do here as far as trying to uh, break down a, some type of statistics on the proportion of those that were women, you know, the proportion of accounts that re were representative of, uh, you know, collective institutions and so forth. But th just from an unofficial type of uh, analysis of it, I would say predominantly the accounts were opened by individuals, but there are enough accounts representing collective entities that if you have a particular institution such as a, a church in mind, I think as a just um, you know a potential just from a potential research um, objective, you can try to uh, identify that institution in these particular records. If you know that there was a particular church uh, in a in a county that was had was. Uh, overseen by a particular field office during this period. Again, the Freedman's Bank is going to, during this time, it's the only, oftentimes the only, finan the only financial institution available throughout the South in particular. And it's gonna, it's, it was one of the first multi-state financial institutions of its time in American history. Today we're you know, used to, you know, uh, various financial institutions being nationwide and sometimes even international. During the period of the Freedmen's Bank, most banks and other financial institutions were local. So the Freedmen's Bank was one of the first multi-state financial institutions, and oftentimes it's going to be the only uh, ostensibly secure institution in many of these areas. So anyone who needs to you know, secure their monies or make a deposit, you know, oftentimes they would use one of the branches of the Freedmen's Bank to do so. So, yes, uh, if you're looking for information on a particular institution, I think that would be a very good research topic, you know, just to quickly check the Freedmen's Bank records to see if there was anyone who uh, made a deposit on behalf of an institution. Even if you search by the name of that particular institution and nothing comes up, I would suggest that you identify individuals who were associated with the particular institution, such as a church, and see if, you know, even though the account was opened in the name of an individual, perhaps once you look at the account, you know, similar to uh, Alfred Pope's uh, Freedman's Bank record, you know, once you look at the account, you may see some type of notation or extra information on there indicating that the account is open on the behalf of a larger institution. So also in your research, try to identify individuals who may have, you know, proceeded to do that on the behalf of an institution, such as the person who was the treasurer of a particular institution. Damani, we have one last question that has come to us through Twitter. The person asked, wondering how often a former master was listed on these records. Was it common? Why would they include it? Uh, at this time, oftentimes it's one of the questions that's asked. Now, with the Freedmen's Bank records, 
the information provided is going to vary from record to record. You know, um, so not there's not going to be a situation where in every case the name of the former master is given. Um, again, you know, I don't have any statistical information to say that, you know, it, it, the names of the masters are given this many times as opposed to not given, but it's something that occurs often, often enough that I think the Freeman's Bank records are one of the, the great pieces of information you can use to get to identify the names of former slaveholders. It's one of those few pieces of federal records that you can use to do so. So um, not in every case again, but it, that the names are provided often enough that, you know, if you haven't found the name of the, you know, the owners or the slaveholders elsewhere, you can potentially find that information in the Freedmen's Bank records. Thank you. As you can see from Damani's uh, talk and uh, his comments on your questions, speakers will be answering questions at the end of each session. Uh, if you want to send them in live, you can do that on our Ustream or Twitter. If we don't have time to cover all of the questions, uh, please feel free to, to direct your questions to inquire, I-N-Q-U-I-R-E, at NARA, N-A-R-A, dot gov, G-O-V. This afternoon, uh, Eastern Standard Time, 1 to 4, our hotline will be open, uh, where archivists will be able to, they'll be available to help you with certain questions that you have on your family research. That toll-free number is... One eight five five three oh nine eight four oh four. That's one eight five five three zero nine eighty four oh four. Thank you. <laughs>